when you know the cars and you start grabbing it by the scruff of the neck and you take ownership of that car and you tell it what to do, the driving experience properly changes. Once you know the tyres, once you know the car, you can really start having some fun on it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. I am Sam Moores. And with me today, I have Oliver Hume. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Welcome. Can you tell the audience a little sort of short summary who you are and what you do? No problems at all. Firstly, thank you for having me. My name is Oliver Hume, as you just said. I am owner and director or co-owner and director of Le Mans Coupes Limited. We are UK importers for Superformance, uh, Spartan Motor Company and Hyper Racer. So we build continuation and recreation 60 sports and race cars and have just introduced a, a range of um, modern sports and race cars as well. Nice. Where did this journey begin? It started a while ago. So my father, Nigel Hume, who's the, the, the co-owner and co-director of the business, has been involved with big American V8s all his life. He owned a very famous race car, Racing Cobra 39PH, and campaigned that for, well, owned it and campaigned it for 35 years. Also raced T70s um, heavily. He owned an original GT40 many moons ago. And so I was brought up around these sorts of iconic 60s sports and race cars. Yeah. And um, it got to a point where Nigel was looking to sell 39PH because he'd gone over to America to a Shelby convention. And he met with uh, one of his friends who had a Superformance Cobra. And obviously with Nigel having a Cobra of his own, the chap said, come and have a drive, see what you think of it. And he drove it and he loved it. It's a modern box section chassis with um, full independent suspension. So it drove like a modern car. And Nigel loved it. And he said, well, let me introduce you to Jim Price, who owns um, Superformance, high-tech automotive now, which is the factory that builds the cars. And he knew of Nigel through 39PH. And so mm. they became really good friends. And uh, through that, Nigel became the UK agent for Superformance. And they were originally doing the Daytona Cobras. And that was in 2003. We got the first car in, just as I was starting university. Um, I remember sitting in um, in halls watching Fifth Gear with Vicky Butler Henderson test driving one of the early Daytona Cobras. And I was like, this is what I want to do. This is where I want my life to be. I want to be involved with these cars. I want to be working in the family business. And um, yeah, it took a long while for him to say yes. So <laughs> I sort of had a, a, a doing some um, amateur racing and just enjoying that and and job hopping really looking for what I wanted to do and find my sort of vocation and it always come back to this and long story short Nigel turned 70 and I said now he was like yeah he wanted to slow down so he's still in the business quite actively but a lot less involved than he was before mm. and so um, he said yeah now's the time so he handed over the keys to the business and um, I've been growing it since then and we've been representing Superformance and now Hyper Race and uh, Spartan as well. Yeah, it's a, we went for a drive in a GT40. Yes. What variant version? It would be good to break down sort of, I guess, what the Superformance cars are available and how do they compare to original, et cetera, et cetera. Can you just give me a little a sort of summary of the different variants and what's available and then also what we went for driving? Yeah, happily. So... Fundamentally, Superformance are continuation and recreation 60 sports and race cars with a, a focus, I guess, around Shelby, although there is a Corvette um, model in the range as well. So everything is done correctly. So if I do it in a sort of a, a linear way, the first car, well, technically the first car they did was the 47 of the Mark III Cobra. But the first car that we were involved with was, was the Daytona Cobra, um, which is just iconically beautiful. But Peter Brock, who designed the car in period, was in contact with high tech, oh, Superformance High Tech Automotive. And the brief was, here's a clean sheet of paper, design the car you would have built in period if you didn't have the time constraints faced to, yeah. to make the car aerodynamic for Le Mans. And so that's what he did. So he created the Daytona Cobra, which was, which was a great success. It's a lovely car. And then off that, they started um, working on the GT40 project, which is what we went out in. So the GT40 is a continuation GT40. So it's got a GT40P chassis number, goes on the world registry, it's built with the original drawings. So 
where they left off production in the 60s, we've continued it with the GT40P 2000 series range of cars. And now within that range of cars, you can have a, a Mark I, which is what we went out in. We went with the, a mid-bodied car. Um, you can have a narrow-bodied car. You can have a FIA HTP race car, which you'll see racing at many of the prestigious historic yeah. events. Or you can go for the Mark II, which is actually what the road car chassis is based on because it's a stronger reinforced chassis with the Mark II bodywork. And then we also do a GT40P 1000 series tool room copy car of GT40P 1075, which is the two-time Le Mans winning car. So just iconic. It's the GT40 yeah. of GT40s, I guess. And so we, we we do those as well. I think there's a production run of 50. Uh, there's one in the UK. So we do that. And then we also do the, the Cobra range. So the uh, Mark III, which is a recreation, but it's Shelby sanctioned. So Carol Shelby, funny enough, came to the factory. Well, he sent a cease and desist. Um, he said, stop building yeah. these cars. And uh, the factory said, look, come on out, have a look at the factory, see what we're doing, see the cars, get a flavor for our business. If you don't like what we're doing, well, down tools, done, job done. And he loved it so much. He put his name to, um, he, he sanctioned the the Cobras and um, the Daytona Cobras now carry a CSX 9000 series chassis number. Some of the Cobras also carry CSX chassis numbers, Carroll Shelby Export. So he basically loved what we did. And so the Mark III is a recreation. So aesthetically and dimensionally, it's true to the original 427 cars, uh, but it's got a modern box section chassis with full independent suspension, as I said before. So it drives like, it, a resto mod would be a, a good, definition of it you can have a more period engine or you can go with a modern mustang engine the coyote engine which makes for a great car and then on top of that we also do the mark ii or the mark ii fia which is a traditional cobra chassis the tejero style chassis with transverse leaf spring suspension uh, so it has a lot more of the original features of an original cobra so that's sort of the the, the range we do on that side of things and we'll, we'll talk about the spartan and the hyper racer later on and sure. if you want to let's say you want to race one of those cars and you take it to a some sort of historic event mm -hmm. i guess different historic events have different rules for what sort of thing applies so if your car is fia htp it's got the technical yeah. passport and got the papers you can race it in eligible events so it conforms to the 60s cars so there's no advantage to having ours over a period car yeah. so yeah it, it comes down to the individual organization if they're they're happy to have you race but a lot of our cars raced at goodwood either members or revival they've raced at um silverstone classic the spa six hours we've won at the spa six hours i think i think we've won at each of these historic events so it's just um speaking with the organizers and understanding if your car is eligible which when they've got the fia papers they are yeah and can you look at them and say, like, distinguish straight away that they're different? Or I guess you do the tool room copy, which is the same. Yeah. But the normal ones, do they look slightly different or? So other than the patina of a period car, potentially, yeah. but they've all been painted and, you know, restored mm. and, and sorted. The road car that we went out in is different to the FIA race car. So as I say, the road car we went in has a Mark II chassis uh, rather than Mark I. The race cars that we build tend to be the narrow body cars so pre-66 because of the regulations yeah, uh, years and whatnot. yeah 289 engine and all of this so if you look at one of our road cars you'll see the differences so fundamentally it's the same but the dash we don't have the fuse box external to the dash it's sort of hidden within there just a nicer aesthetic we've moved the handbrake from under the passenger's legs or knees over the knees to a center tunnel uh you know just just things we have to do to pass iva to get it on the road but fundamentally that, that feature you're saying yeah the handbrake on the original cars is under the passenger like next to the passenger's legs yeah yeah just above the knees yeah how you meant to, you're not you're not pulling that out any point in time other than stationary no i don't i don't think there's any need for a handbrake turn at Le Mans. i think they were <laughs> i think it was um no it it's a safety thing for for the modern roads um and the majority of the gt40s were designed as race cars so it wasn't thinking about passenger comfort yeah. it was very much like all-out race car yeah we need it for if it's on a truck other than that it's on yeah. the flat and i think the, re the regulations stipulated that it was a road legal car you know so yeah. it is it, it, is an exercise in jumping through hoops like with the cobras if you've seen ford versus ferrari or Le Mans 66 whatever you want to call it um where he had to get luggage in the back of the car so he hits it with a hammer yeah. to make this it's that sort of thing you had to just to conform to the regulations the, the so the car we went out in the road car for I don't know, half an hour yep. something like that you drove for a bit i drove for a bit it's a wet day but 
the, the things that I sort of picked up straight away, which are like different, I immediately forgot the car that I was in. And then you get out and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm in a GT40. <laughs> you can't forget that you've got the engine of a GT40. But that experience, the pedals, the, what is, I'm trying to describe the throttle pedal. It's unlike any car I've driven yep. before. And it's, you kind of have to press it down. Yeah, you want to come from the top down because if you're pushing up against it, the throw of the throttle, you'll be fighting up until it goes past that point and then it will, then, then you'll get the... Um, but it's, it's like anything. Any car has its individual yeah, totally. quirks. And once you know it, it's fine. And because you're a bit taller than me, you're a bit further forward. So if we had a slightly thinner seat in there... Because, again, I, I say this a lot when I'm talking to clients or prospective clients or interviews. It's a 60s race car, warts and all. Yeah. So, you know, you're driving a race. So it doesn't have seat slides. It doesn't have pedal slides. The pedal box is adjustable, but it's a manual process. So you have to undo the pedal yeah. box, move it back. You forward. set it for the owner. Yeah, exactly right. And so um, we have thinner seats, thicker seats. Some of our clients have been shorter than others. So we've got really thick seats. Others, I think the, the tall, I think the shortest owner is about five foot two. The tallest we've had to date is six foot five. We think six, oh, wow. six would be the tallest that would fit into one. Um, so it's just about adjusting it to that. So when it's set up for you, that little nuance of, oh, the pedal feels weird is eliminated because it's just the natural pedal position. But um, yeah, it's effectively a period race box. So it's, it's really it's interesting. Like, I've, I've, yeah, I've never driven anything like that. The only other sort of reference point I've got for slightly funky pedals is older 911s yeah. with the, the different hinging, which you get used to straight away. And this yeah. was just one of those things like, you're like, I can tell I'd get used to this. Yeah. But it was just a point of, this feels really odd. At first, I was, I was trying to press my whole foot forward, like let's say yeah. to try and describe it, like heel and toe yeah. forward in the same motion. Yeah. You might move a pedal and the pedal doesn't move. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, what's going on here? And then, yeah, you literally just have to like toes straight down. Yeah, so if, if your heel's further back and your toe's coming yeah. down at an angle like that, that's where it will go. And it's funny because um, you got in the car and we haven't really talked about driving it. We've been chatting about you and what yeah, you've been doing yeah. and a bit about me. And so we didn't have that conversation about actually driving the car. So you sort of jumped in the deep end and you're like, oh, let's go for a drive. And so you did really well. I mean, I've been with people that I haven't particularly wanted to sit next to. Well, um, we did have a discussion cause... about this be before I drove. Like just doing a passenger ride, in a, a car like that, what is it, seven litres, 500-ish yeah. horsepower, 1,200 kilos, yeah. no driver aids, today's a wet day, which I wonder is possibly the safer scenario in terms of a passenger ride because most people will not have confidence. Yeah, I, I quite like that. Maybe I'll get everyone down on a wet day. Maybe they won't, though. <laughs> like, yeah, I think the, the joy of the car is... The chassis is so well developed. It won Le Mans three times with that chassis. GT40 won four times because if you include the Mark IV um, in 67. It's such a well developed chassis. One of my favorite things, they spent 30 million in period on the chassis, which is over a billion dollars in today's money. It that was a lot. lot of money developing it. It was win at all costs. It was beat Ferrari. You've seen the film, I'm sure. Yeah. It was it was win at all costs. So the chassis is exceedingly well developed. So what you don't have is snap over steer. It, it talks to you, you're driving through the seat of your pants and it's talking to you through your bum. You can feel what the car's doing. You can feel the movement. So you drove really sensibly. If you had another hour within the car, I would have said, right, let's start giving it a bit of beans. Yeah. We gave, gave it a bit of beans when it was uh, when it was dry and, you know, that, that was yeah, great. Yeah. But it's so competent. We, we talked before about um, my adventure at still uh, Brands Hatch, sorry, coming out of Clearways on a drying day on a nice bit of dry tarmac accelerating onto pit straight found the wet patch and um, that wasn't too exciting and and so i got this massive tank slapper on and genuinely i had a friend in the car he was like how did you save that and i do a bit of amateur racing fine but it was purely down to the chassis i'm, I'm sure if i was in 90 percent of other cars that was a four corner crash because it just talks to you and it tells you it's like i'm gonna go that way like and it just allows you to modulate and, and get through it and we had a little bit of tire slip accelerating away at one point and I, did, I didn't fight like it in a car with someone that I don't know. And I was like, yeah, this is all right. Yeah. There's nothing crazy going on here. I'm I just think moving forwards. It's the predictability of it. It talks to you. And um, another thing I said to you and I say a lot is when you know the cars and you start grabbing it by the scruff of the neck and you take ownership of that car and you tell it what to do, the driving experience properly changes and that's what you need to do with these cars to get the maximum out of it. And, you know, it runs on these Avon CR6 ZZ tyres, which is a race 
carcass with a road compound. Okay. Um, so you look at it, it looks like a slick with a zigzag in it. Yeah. Surprisingly competent in the wet. They're great on the road, they're great on track, they're great in the wet, they're great in the dry. It's a fantastic all-round tyre. Now, if you were to put a wet weather tyre on it, it's going to handle better than those tyres. But yeah. as an all-rounder, it's fantastic. So once you know the tyres, once you know the car, you can really start having some fun on it. But equally, on the road, you never want to be getting to 100% of the limit anyway. <laughs> you'll, no. you'll, be, you'll be pressing on with that 7-litre um, engine. Yeah. And the, those cars, so the, the race cars changed in engines over time, didn't they? They started small, got mm-hmm. large, then went back small again. Is that right? Yeah. So and I say small, they're not small. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, so um, they're originally a, a 289, which is a 4.7 litre engine. And then in 66, the regulations changed. So they went to 7 litre, which is where you get the Mark II, which is what was in Ford versus Ferrari. And then after 66, the regulations changed and they went, to the Mark IV GT40, which in honesty, I don't know a huge amount about because it's a very complex honeycomb chassis. I don't know much about it. It's not a car that yeah. we're, we're involved with. Um, and then for 68 and 69, the regulations changed and it went back to 5 litre, uh, which is where 1075 won twice. And I think another reason why it won, especially in 69, when it was against 917s and various other Ferraris and all sorts of you know hot competition, was the longevity. It is a solid chassis. It can take abuse of a modern rose, which is why we went actually Mark II chassis. It's a stronger chassis. But it it, it just outlasted everything. Um, so it's so well developed, so strong, which is part of the reason for its success. It's about two, three hundred kilos heavier than the, the than its competition, but it's still still won. Yeah. And you see so many videos of people driving GT forties at Goodwood or whatever in the wet. Just like <laughs> all over the place <laughs> as soon as you said it i knew exactly which video you were talking about it was the kenny brack qualifying yeah. session i mean that is just that's that, quite that, something <laughs> yeah that that's just gt40 porn isn't it i don't know yeah. it's, um, it was incredible there's two videos i think of like classic racing that stick in my mind one is that one and another one is a guy and whenever i mention this to people in that space they're like oh no it's that guy there's a guy that races i think it's short wheel race 911s okay and it's, it's obviously a different car. Yeah. The, vi- the videos look sort of similar. It's just like fully, yeah. fully all over the place. I mean, when, when you've got someone fully committed and forgetting that they're worth multi-million pounds yeah. or whatever it is, when someone's committed and on it, it's just just a joy to watch. Like, yeah. It's, oh, it's, yeah, it's so yeah. cool. So yeah. cool. So that, that's an interesting point. So the the originals of how many original cars are there? Loosely 100, 200, give or take. I don't oh, think okay. it's a that's huge more, figure. That's more than I thought. Um, there's those cars. Or you could buy a Superformance. Are there, are there are there other people that will make you a GTP? Uh, no one else has the uh, the GT40P chassis, right? So no one else builds GT40s. We are the exclusive okay. GT40s. There are other companies out there who do a cracking job in building them. And it's very similar with the Cobra market. What I love about the GT40 market is we sit at the very top end mm. of what you can get outside of an original. So we do continuation cars that are GT40s in their own right. We can have those road cars. We can have those race cars. Other companies build very accurate race cars. We compete with them for the win all the time. And arguably their chassis was more accurate 15 years ago to the Mark I okay. pre-66 race cars that you'd see at Goodwood. We're now... It's pay your money, take your choice on which way you yeah. go with it. But we come with the luxury of being actually a GT40. Now people yeah. call it a GT40, fine, it is what it is. But there's something all the way down, you know, for 15, 20 grand, you can get something, call it a GT40. I struggle when people look down on those cars mm. because not everyone in life has been successful enough to be in a position where they're able to do that. But it doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to fulfill their passion for those cars. So we're involved with GT40 Enthusiast Club, yeah. which is a fantastic club. And you get cars, not just GT40s, but um, all of the kit cars, all the way through to original cars. And it's such a great community because everyone's got that shared passion. And I think yeah. that's brilliant. But we're, we're just very fortunate that we sit at the top of that market. And is the Ford sort of family i guess not not, i don't mean literally the ford family (laughs) i mean like the sort of wider group of enthusiasts and whatnot generally are they quite an accepting group let's say an example that might not would be i think historically ferrari owners are quite like it needs to be exactly what it is Mm -hmm. don't mess with it like porsche is quite good at having stuff messed with is the ford gt kind of community pretty 
open and shelf. Yeah, hundred percent. So um, our cars are GT40s. They're not Ford GT40s, so we don't have the association mm-hmm. with Ford. Um, Sapphire Spares own the rights to the GT40 name, so um, that's why the 05 and the 17 onward cars are Ford okay. GTs, not GT40s. Yeah, but there seems to be a very good relationship. We've had it where Ford have used our cars for events um, on display or, you know, lo- lots of different things. So, yeah, it's it's. I think Jaguar went through a phase, didn't they, where they tried to stop continuations and recreations and there was the whole, yeah. you know, whole suits around that, lawsuits around that. But to my knowledge and my experience, Ford have been absolutely great. There seems to be a good relationship. It's quite, it's cool seeing them around and seeing cars racing. And I think if I was to do some historic racing, I couldn't afford a original race winning whatever gt40 i don't know what they are cost now what do they cost what my I, I mean do, you know again, what the, do we know loosely what the top of the market is well i think 1075 the double amount yeah. winner i believe when it last changed hands it was 25 million dollars that's the sort of number i thought it's the that's the two-time Le Mans winner i think it's telephone numbers it's it yeah make an offer see if it's accepted it's it's big numbers if you want that car you're only ever that's the only one it's the only one yeah yeah, so it's, it's telephone numbers. Um, an original, I mean, if you found something for under two million, I think you'd have done really yeah. well. I, I, because it's not an area I'm involved with yeah, with yeah. those cars. It's just the next level. I would have thought three to five million. You're in yeah. in the ballpark. So, and then a super performance car that's eligible to race. Obviously, you've got to get accepted to race in whatever race series you're pitching at. What would that cost? You're around the three to four hundred thousand pound mark, inclusive of VAT. It will depend on spec, what engine yeah. you're getting, um, you know, gearbox availability and pricing, and um, you know, if you're going for the ultra lightweight bodywork, if you're going for the long range fuel tanks, there's lots of things that will affect that. Oh, okay, so we- there's spec differences in terms of if you want to race at a uh, 65, 66 year type mm-hmm. situation. You can have different configurations. Yeah, so a short range tank's just going to be cheaper, but you wouldn't go and do the spa six hour with yeah. that because you'd be doing more pit stops and you wouldn't be competitive. So it depends what your intended use is um, if you want it just for a track day. But we our main focus is the road cars. We've done plenty of FIA HTP cars and um, we continue to do them. We've got a client whose GT40 you saw here, which yeah. we're, we're, we're returning next week. He's got one and we're looking at building that for him. So... It is something that happens, but it's not the core of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Driving the cars, the things that's oh, okay, immediately like, okay, this pedal's a bit different. Okay, that, that requires some getting used to. You've got the gear stick, you're in a right-hand drive, put a gear stick on the right-hand side. Yeah, that's still mounted, yeah. unique. I'm not, well, it's not, I don't think it's unique to that car. It's of, it's, a, it's of that era, isn't mm-hmm. it? That's quite fun. Um, really sort of narrow gearbox yeah which is quite quite cool and then you have the doors that open and for the first couple of times i tried to get out of the car was sort of ducking out of the car yeah, yeah. and then i was like oh right yeah the bit above my head disappears when you open the door so you can just stand straight up yeah that's quite a fun like unique to that car yeah the, the situation little, the, the, the guillotine doors um <laughs> Uh, you'll hit your head once you'll hit it twice and then you get used to it quickly and you don't hit it anymore so yeah but the 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 gear shift again because it's built to the original drawings it's got the still mounted gear shift the only reason for that is was more direct gear shift you know for the gearbox because otherwise you've got a, a you know a wire shift which isn't as direct or as accurate we can do so the car can be provided in left-hand drive um, they okay. never were in period, but you, you can just have to reach drive. across to the passenger's yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> reach over the passenger's <laughs> lap. Um, no, it's a center shift and we can do a center shift. So if you're a, um, a larger owner, you know, packing a bit more girth around the mid mid rift by having a center mounted gear shift, um, you buy an extra two or three inches okay. in the seat. So you can have a wider seat. Um, and yeah, but we've had one that was specced with a center shift because that's just what he wanted. Yeah, It sold um funnily enough it sold before the gentleman took ownership of it because he lost his license um, oh, <laughs> but the, the the gentleman that bought it um converted it to sill mounted so yeah, oh, yeah. And, and do most people if they go do you sell majority to the uk or you sort of yeah around? correct we're, we're uk agents so most people right hand drive yeah as original do you know if around the world do most people do people get right hand drive ones because they were right hand drive I think so. America is obviously the biggest market for yeah. the for the it's where Super Performance are based, um, and I see a lot of right hand drive cars over there. But I also see a lot of left hand drive cars because it just makes sense that 
it's a GT40 in its own right, so it doesn't matter just because they made them in, in period and it, it's easier to overtake. It's easier to drive yeah. around there. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're left-hand drive as well. We've not done a left-hand drive. Do they anything. do left-hand drive, left sill? No, because the way that the <laughs> gearbox far. is... But yeah, it would be a, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an engineering step too far. <laughs> um, yeah, they'd, they'd be sent them out. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, you're, you're like a, one of those offshore power boats yeah. where the passenger's doing the <laughs> gears yeah, exactly. and you're doing the steering. Yeah. Yeah, and then I guess the the main thing that is is evident the whole time is the engine. Yeah, just that experience of that engine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. That's great. Yeah, I mean they're fantastic units. So we can build a car with anything from a two eight nine, so the four point seven, all the way through to the seven liter. Um, there was a car in Finland that I think was an eight liter, something like that. And yeah, put, put a massive old engine in it. Uh, I don't think it particularly needed yeah so it depends what you're and, and we were talking about this and i never answered your question in the car which was of the engines which do you prefer yeah so the majority of the road cars that we've done have had a 5.7 liter engine 5.2 5.7 liter engine the joy of them is they've got plenty of torque they've got plenty of power low down fine but their party pieces when they get over 4,000 rpm and you get to yeah. open it up and you feel like an absolute rock star just hooning it with the yeah. revs high so it, it's brilliant the the bigger engines the bigger which we've seen a shift towards recently the seven liter engines i think it's got more torque more power it's a lot more low down so you've got a lot of the power delivery earlier it'll rev out it'll rev to six and a half like the others will but you've got more rotating mass and you're done by about five and a half thousand you're yeah. shifting and, and you're fine so i'd say it depends what your intended use is if you really like revving through and that that enjoyment there if you just want instant yeah you know, yeah talk. i guess the bigger engine presumably one could buy but if you want the smaller engine presumably someone could build you a 500 horsepower smaller engine now if you wanted yeah the the since the 60s engine technology has moved on i think in period you're about 380 horsepower with the yeah. gt40 so people get romantic about horsepower mm. when actually you can over engine a car I think between 450 and 550 is a real sweet spot for the GT40s uh, with the modern road tires, uh, with the modern tire technology, and um, you know what they're capable of and the and the strength of the chassis. That's a lovely sweet spot. So I think if you're within that range, you're fine. But even at 380, 400, 410 horsepower, That's plenty. you're having a lot of fun and you're using the revs more, and it's just just a different driving style. So it totally depends what the client's after. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely for me as a road experience like the car we drove had plenty of power yeah don't need any more power you could also put an argument in for having a bit less yeah and as you say yeah you can rev it out and you'll be able to rev it out more often more aggressively without worrying about traction yeah whereas if you've got a big old whack of torque i think that comment might change if you drove it purely in the dry because the traction is oh, yeah. really okay. good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's really, really like, good. Okay. Um, no, but fine. I know I know exactly what you mean. And I'd, I'd say that, I mean, you know, purist wise, I would get a Mark II with a seven litre and a Mark I with up to six litres. The seven litre engine in the Mark I works surprisingly well. Yeah. I really love it. Um, it's just where you want to have your power delivery. And if you like revving it out, then the smaller engine is a better engine. If you like it instant, not to say that a, a 5.7 litre engine isn't instant because it's still got a load of torque. Yeah. You compare it to like, I don't hey, know, your, turbocharged. you know, whatever car you're driving. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, so it's still got ample. It's, um, yeah. It's still a big engine. Yeah. 5.7 litres. Now, if you think about modern engines, yeah. they're like 2 point yeah. something. Oh, what, V8. What, GI, GI Yaris's, what are they? They're like 1.3 oh, yeah, or tiny. something. But yeah, even so, a Ferrari, like yeah. a 296, it's a 2 point something. Yeah. 2.9. Yeah. But what I can Sorry. assure you is whatever engine you choose, you're coming out with a smile. That's it. <laughs> like, it's kind of, you st you've got a rowdy American V8 that yeah puts a smile on. Then you get out of this car and you're like, oh yeah, there's a GT40. That's pretty cool. Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're cool things. It's funny, you, um, you mentioned you sell the Daytona Coupes. Yes. I drove a Daytona Coupe and I do, what I wonder where it came from. It was... It was on a gumball a long, long time ago. One of the guys was that had one um, built. Team Gal Galan. Mm, yeah. yeah, that was the super performance. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, well, so I drove that car from Edinburgh Airport or some airport. No, it wasn't Edinburgh Airport. It was a bit further away to the grid in um, in Edinburgh. So I think it was about an hour drive. Yeah. That was the first car like that I had driven. Yeah. That was a whale of a time. Yeah. It's a big VA. 
people are like overrun buyings and whatever it was it gave it was a real like up until that point i think i'd only driven like sort of modern european sports yeah. cars like yeah. porsches and high revving stuff like that yeah and then yeah drove that car and was like oh i could see why you might go have something like this yeah and that shape that shape is so cool yeah well i i think the reason why the factory lead times are quite long at the moment is there's been this rebellion against digital cars people yeah. you know I, I think alluded to it then it's what you're putting into the car you're getting out so um your driver inputs dictate how that's performing on the road you're not being controlled by a computer uh, you know you don't have the track control sorting everything out you don't have abs getting you out of trouble it's like right what i'm putting in will be what i get out and that that's i think people want that it's, it's a pure driving experience yeah and that's what they're coming here for yeah. to go and get a pure driving experience yeah yeah, it's pretty cool. So then you do those ones, you need the the Cobras, yep. which are similar with no roof. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, they're not they they are and they're not. I mean the um GT forties have the original monocoque chassis pressed steel roof, so it's um a, a different animal. Um sorry, I meant the Daytonas. Oh sorry, I'm with you. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the Daytonas and the, the normal Cobras are fundamentally a lot closer linked than um than the GT forties, yeah. Talking about uh, the Cobra options, I guess you can get a sort of exact-ish copy yep. of a, an original and then some ones that have been tweaked a little bit. Yeah, correct. So the Mark II, which is also known as the slab side or the 289, is more accurate to the originals than the Mark III or the 427 yeah. um, in the fact that it's got the three-inch tubular chassis, a Tajiro-style chassis. It's got um, transverse leaf spring suspension, um, so it's a lot more original. So the, the, the driving experience is a lot more 60s than yeah. the Mark III, which is a modern car with independent suspension. Yeah, so you can you know really choose which way you want to go. The Mark III has been more popular, and the Mark III with the Coyote or a 427 engine have been the, the the ones that people have wanted. Why do you think that is? I think it's just the poster child of the 60s, much like a Countach is of yeah. you know, that era. A lot of our clients grew up and they're like, I had a blue and white Cobra on my wall with white side pipes. And that's yeah. what I want. And so um, it's just what they know. And then um, if you couple it with the modern Mustang engine, so the, the five litre Coyote engine, the period cars ran Mustang engines of yeah. the time. So whilst it's a retro mod, it works and um, you get, incredible performance through the rev range torque it's got variable valve timing they're fail safe engines i did 200,000 miles before you need to think about it they're 450 out the box you can tune it to 700 uh, it's just it, it's just before changing the internals that is yeah they're just fantastic units so um yeah and then the 289 i would argue is a much prettier car we've got the mark ii fia variant so it's not fias and you couldn't go and race it there's different pickup points it's slightly different to the to the original car but in aesthetic, it's it, so the cars. Our cars were used in Ford versus Ferrari or Le Mans sixty six, the film. So the the car where Christian Bale throws his spanner at the windscreen, that's one of our FIA okay, cars. Yeah. So um, and the the one that Matt Damon's cruising around in, that's one of our cars. So um, a really pretty, elegant car. I just think people know the Mark Threes more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do. I, I I personally, if I was choosing a Cobra range, I would go for the Mark Two. What do they like to drive? Very period, like the Mark IIs, again, I, I, I've said it three or four times, so I don't need to repeat myself, but the suspension is as it was with the transverse leaf spring. So it's, um, I guess, more basic, a bit more agricultural would be the word I would yeah. use. But equally, you've got a 289 or a 302, usually a 302. Um, ours, we've actually gone for a um, 347, so a 5.7 litre engine, But because uh, it's got the, the FIA car's got wider wheels and it can take more power. But if you're going for the slab side, the, 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 the prettier car, I'd argue... You've got a three, uh, sorry, five liter engine, so you don't have huge power. You, you know, two two ninety to three fifty would be a lovely power point for it. So it's brilliant. Like you're not going to win a, a drag race off the lights against a another modern car, yeah. but you have so much more fun getting there, and it's um, it's usable and it's enjoyable. So yeah, it, it's just a throw, a true throwback to the sixties. So they feel hairy. It depends how you're driving it. I sort of was brought up with Cobra, so I knew them. It's what. You know, Nigel and yeah. 39PH, as I said, and um, it used to be our birthday treat. He'd come and pick us up from school in 39PH and like all the kids nice. were crowd around. It was great. Like he had a lot of nice toys, but he didn't like showing off too much. But on occasion, he'd you know, take yeah. us out and we'd, we'd have some fun. Sorry, I got lost in the memories there. What was the question? Are they hairy? <laughs> hairy. Um, they can be. 
of course. Again, it's no drive raids. You know, you've got big power, small tires. So if you want to drive like a hooligan, you can. I think they command respect. I think they probably can't command more respect than GT40. But once you know them, they're very pliable, if that's the right word. Um, you, you can throw them about, you can yeah. enjoy them. But with the 289, especially the slab side, I would say it's more of a country cruiser. You you could put, you know, your Bumble bags in the back of, uh, uh, and, and cruise to the south of France and, um, you know, go away for a long weekend and visit vineyards. And, you know, it, it, it's lovely. You know, nice silenced pipes on there. Um, if you want to open them up and, you know, have that raw V8 grumble, then you can. So, yeah, it, it, it's like anything. If you get them set up nicely, they're fine. It's, but you you want to respect the right foot. Yeah, and power delivery relatively linear yeah or but, you do get a nice whack of torque no it, it's pretty linear again it would depend on um engine and setup and um you know if you've gone for a because we run all our cars on injections because we have to meet modern emission standards okay um so everything goes through iva to be legal and compliant in the uk so it depends you know if you've got a all at eight stack or similar gen v8 stack you know it, it's a bit more power top end and um you know but if you've got the weber uh, sorry the holly system more power low end it, it depends how you set it up but it's never like a 911 turbo where you're yeah uh, old 911 turbo i think wait, 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 pretty wait, well boom. now yeah yeah nothing 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 ditch yeah it's not like that it's getting cars through iva is that a faff what sort of things do you have it's like lights and whatever isn't it yeah it's just making sure it complies to the regulations of the day and um as much of a headache as that can be i think they're there the, those rules and regulations are there for a good reason so um you know it's just hoops we've got to jump through but we're happy to do it because you know we love having these cars on the road so um it's just a, a necessity but we um we work with iva closely they're, they're they're great we we tend to get cars through first time sometimes it's a two attempt so um yeah no it's fine yeah, 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 we we actually work with other clients. Um, you saw a car in the in the workshop at the moment, advising and assisting with IVA. So um, if you have a a kit car or a, an okay, imported yeah, yeah. car, um, we're happy to provide some consultancy or expertise to to help people get through IVA. Yeah, we're now sitting in a workshop, and next to us is a, a Spartan. Is that yep. what it's called? Yep. Can you just talk to me through what what is that? So the Spartan is. I mean, in one word, it's epic. Absolutely. I'm, I'm in love <laughs> with this car. So it's a track-focused sports car, which we've got on the road in the UK, effectively. So just to give you a bit of history around it, Nigel used to race Lolo T70s quite extensively, Mark 3s, 3Bs predominantly. Um, he had spiders and all sorts. And But ever since a kid, T70 was my dream and I loved it. And um, I was on Instagram looking through one day, looking at other avenues we can introduce to the business to sort of diversify a bit away from just super performance. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just saw this post. I think it was a Top Gear article on the Spartan in Australia. And I saw it was about front third. profile. So if you imagine looking at it just at the front wheel arch, yeah, um, it was that and it just looked like a t7 and i was like that is beautiful and so i reached out to them and i said you know what's happening with the business what what where you up to and they go oh well we're literally about to go into production with the cars and i said uk agent they're like yep <laughs> so we, we told, <laughs> told them what we did with super performance and um and just formed a relationship with them um peter and nick pap absolute legends lovely chaps can't do enough for you we said if it's in the uk we need it on the road because there's so few days where you can have an open top sports car yeah you know work commitments, family commitments, everything else. Like you can't go to a track day all the time. So it had to be on the road. And they worked with us again with the IVA to get through the IVA process. And what we've got sat next to us is the late stage production prototype. So because we're getting it on the road, we knew there'd be development areas and a bit of refinement that was needed, which we've worked on. And the, the final production spec car is on the rolling road tomorrow. Um, oh, so okay. it's so close to being complete. There's been a lot of setbacks through covid and then through the development process and suppliers and everything that you'd expect with a new business yeah. a new, new new firm but they've now been addressed and ironed out and so we're, we're geared up for production we're ready to go and um yeah really really excited so when will the first customer cars be delivered um so we've got a car due into the uk i'd anticipate it arriving probably february 
then we'll do the IVA process. And that's yeah. where I'm going to really start kickstarting um, promotion on it. So um, Evo did um, track car of the year this year and we came second overall, second fastest lap time, I think it was overall, behind the Revolution Evo on full slicks. We're running yeah. our road tires. We're quicker than the latest GT3 RS um, by just under a second. We're quicker than the Radical SR3 on our road tires. So that is yes. that is impressive. Yeah, it's a beast. It's uh, yeah. Can you just talk me through a little bit about the car yeah. and also what it's like to drive? Because I know you've driven it on track and yeah. road it and whatnot. Can you give me like basic basic specs of, of what it is? Yeah. So it's in this spec. It's probably going to be a little bit more horsepower. I'll find out tomorrow. It's four hundred and sixty brake horsepower from a two point four liter Honda supercharged engine. Um, it weighs 700 kilos, just, just north of when fully wet, so about 430. So you're in the same power to weight bracket as McLaren F1 LM, Jaguar XJ220, Bugatti Veyron, that sort of car. But Atom? Uh, so we, we were over a, a second more. quicker than the Aerial Atom 4, the latest spec Aerial yeah. Atom. So yeah, we're it's that sort of concept, that sort of yeah. car that we're going for. Um, it's just a... An incredible car. We've got tractive suspension on the so like like the GT40s and the Cobras. There's no drive raids, but we do have tractive suspension. So that's a semi-active suspension system. So it's on a gyro and it's reading the road within fractions of a millisecond and making adjustments all the time. So it knows where to stiffen or soften yeah. the, the, the the suspension. So you get cornering and acceleration that's just incredible because it just puts the power down like you've got traction control, but you don't need the traction yeah. control. It's incredible. It's a fantastic thing. Is this a sequential manual? Manual. Paddle? Again, the, the whole brief was, so it's inspired by 60s sports and race cars. So it's inspired by the T70s, P3, Ferraris, 917 Porsches, all of that sort of stuff. And so they wanted it to be a throwback to that and they wanted it to be engaging. They wanted it to be a driver's car. We did go for a, we had a flat shift sequential gearbox in it for a while, yeah. um, which was a great unit. And if you were just doing track driving in it or racing it, fine. It was just too aggressive. I mean, you're not to 60 in 2.3 seconds That's as quite. it stands um, <laughs> with a manual box and you get such driving. It's such a rewarding car to drive. Richard Meaden compared it to a Lola T70, as I said, like not just aesthetically, but the way it drove. And I yeah. thought that was a huge compliment. It, it's a very competent chassis. Yeah. And on if you're driving it on track or whatever, is it very throttle adjustable with that level of power? Or has it actually got a, quite a lot of grip? Oh, a huge amount of grip. Yeah. So um, with a supercharger, it's very linear power delivery and you've got quite a long throw on the throttle. So um, again, if you build the revs, drop the clutch and hoon it, you get wheel spin. But it's exceedingly predictable. So you can um, control pitch and roll and stiffness through the tractive system, which is all on a little computer. So you can set it up for wet conditions, dry conditions, yeah. uh, track, road, whatever you want to do. It's on a lift kit, so you can lift it up or lower it down. And so, yeah, you can soften the rear to get more traction there. If you want a bit more compliance, you can stiffen it up if you're on track. You, you can do what you want. So the so the the grip levels are are fantastic. And is that all done through the? Is it through an app, or have you got a little twizzle, twizzle dial? There, there's a screen on the um, yeah. on the dash. The new car is going to have a formula steering wheel. So most of the information and adjustability will be on the steering wheel. There's going to be a much smaller center console. So as I say, it's the refinement piece that's coming and that will allow you to control oh, uh, most of the car from there. Has that been a, a sort of customer preference or you, your preference to have that style of steering wheel, especially on the road? So what I was finding was the screen, the aim dash that, there's, that, that yeah. is there at the moment at certain points wasn't visible enough like i mm. the way that i sit in the car i can't see the rev counter at the top so we thought if it's all there on the screen in front yeah. of you then um you, you can't miss it so yeah it was it was just part of the development curve yeah yeah clean it up a little bit yeah have a nice display and exactly. whatnot and then you're gonna have rotary dials on the steering wheel yeah. for settings yeah correct so we're, we're checking the integration with tractive at the moment so we should be able to have preset levels for as i say wet dry road yeah, track yeah. um and then you can just flick through to those and it will also control um you know um screen views and and, and several other little settings that you can you can change yeah and then there, are there different power levels uh no so it's one power level i could look into if we can have different maps but again because of the tractive being so such a incredible right bit of technology it. you change i mean so tractive 
whilst this is about the Spartan, like I've got a big up tractive, they had us at Goodwood Festival of Speed, we were on their stand. And so whilst I'd driven their suspension on the Spartan, I didn't really understand it. Mm. And then I get to see how it worked. And they had a Mustang racing at the Nordschleife and it was many seconds slower than the other competition in its class. As soon as it started raining, they changed the settings. They were over 18 seconds a lap quicker than their competition, <laughs> just because it's like having a little mechanic on each yeah. four corners, adjusting it every second or multiple times a second so the suspension is correct all the time so it just allows you to use the power so those settings that you change over over a power map yeah no i've, I've tried some tractive systems on various different cars and i think it's difficult to you can't necessarily judge it on its own because you, in each car they've been developed and how well yeah. it's been set up on that car yeah for that car is different mm-hmm but I had a play, it was in a, a 993 resto mod and it had, had it just, they had, I think they like one to eight in terms of just standard, like yeah. soft to the stiffest yeah. track and then you could play with it. And I, I really enjoyed just like messing with that. Like yeah. basically for me, it was like, well, I just kind of want to try it on the softest yeah. and see how much this thing moves. Yeah which was pretty cool well when when um we had it with evo at cadwell and we beat the gt3 rs we had it on a road setting so i hadn't even set it to the the track setting so there's definitely more time within it as well so but having been with tractive at goodwood when i drove it um on the road and i fully understood the system i preset a couple of different things and i went out on the road and i went from soft to stiff to um medium and that was the first time i truly felt how yeah. different the car feels because I knew what was being adjusted and it, yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. That is something in the, and it's, it's the same sort of thing. Like the new, uh, new GT3 RS, mm-hmm. I don't know how into modern cars you are. They've got that on the steering wheel. You can change down yeah. settings and stuff like that. And I was just like, I love like the sort of track person in me just wants to mess with that stuff. Yeah. And like, I don't want to stop, jack the car up, change some settings, yeah. go out. You want to be like lap one, Lap two, yeah. same corner, different settings. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. get this going. Or if you're in a race and it does start raining, you know, typically you're looking at the weather on a you know race morning, you're looking at the weather and it's like, right, it looks like it will be raining by 10.30 when my race starts. So I'm going to go a bit softer. Yeah. And then you go soft and you get on the grid. It's like, oh, it's still really dry. <laughs> and so everyone's just going off in the distance because you're on these wet settings because yeah. you've taken a gamble. Whereas this eliminates that totally because it's like, okay, no, it's wet, I'll put it on the um, or dry, I'll put it on the dry settings and um, then it starts raining halfway through the race and you can go soft and that's where you find the advantage. That would be quite cool. So does any race series let you do that then? Could you race this in a series? There's certain series that would take it, it would have to be a sprint series. Um, yeah. One of the biggest upgrades we've got coming or one of the one of the biggest points that I, I, I have coming from the next car is a bigger fuel tank because it's about 30 litres in that, which, okay. you know, I drove from ours to Caffeine and Machine, which is what, a three hour drive, 100, 150, 200 miles, I don't know, 150 miles, give or take. Yeah. Got there on a tank, fine. Um, but you go on track and you're using a lot more fuel when you're on full chat the whole time. So yeah. it's sort of a 15, 20 minute sprint in refuel. So we're adding another 10 litres and that's going to be more than enough for most people. You don't, you, you know, you're on track days, you're probably doing a 15 minute session coming in, letting everything cool yeah, down. Yeah, max 20, like uh, yeah. no one, no yeah. one really. That takes... I don't know how, whether you found that. For me, the first time I did a track day, you do like two laps and you're fried. You're just like, it doesn't matter what car you're in. Yeah. Just so much going on yeah. that you can't do it. And then the build up over time and whatever and blah, 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 blah. And then you're like, oh, I can go and run a full session with a break yeah. in the middle. But that takes quite, that actually takes quite a long time yeah. to build up to that. And then the more intense the car is. Yeah quite intense <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah brilliant yeah it, it, it's intense but it's um I, I yeah one of the first track days i had was at castle coombe and that's a quick circuit it's a really quick it circuit is. and it really opened my eyes because i've driven some quick stuff but it's been historic so the brakes are you know yeah. more 60s than these these are running ap racing brakes and so your stopping distances are much shorter those, and are more aggressive. Those walls are a lot closer when yeah. you start breaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so really, it, it, it took me a while to adjust to it, but it was great. And again, much like the GT40, although very different chassis, it is another predictable chassis, which is just so useful. But I went out with a, a former Formula 2 or GP2 at the time driver uh, around brands, and um, he taught me a few things, and then I implemented it, and it, it, it was just 
brilliant. It's yeah, you can really lean on it because it's got you know plenty of aero on it. Um, it was designed by um, the Pap brothers, but they got um, ex Formula One designer who worked for Williams, he worked for Toyota, he worked for Caterham. So everything works in conjunction with the other. So the the front splitter works with the side skirts and the under yeah. tray and the venturi at the back with the um the rear wing we could get 800 kilos of downforce we're just shy of 500 kilos um at 250 kilometers an hour because we want it to be playful so it goes back to yeah, the yeah. manual gearbox and no drive raids we want it to be playful what we didn't want is mr big wallet going out without much talent relying on the downforce hitting a bump losing all of that suddenly and spinning it where it becomes you know yeah. that's unfair on a lot of drivers a lot of people would be sensible and build up and take their time but it's designed to be playful on the edge so you can still drift it and slide it there was a really good um uh video on autocar where richard lane drove it around angles it was actually the first time it had been out on track with anyone and he was fully sideways with it and it was just <laughs> it was it was great to see so it, it is very playable you can you can use it but then equally you've got enough downforce that you can beat a radical sr3 around a lap time yeah that is impressive and that is something with I thought the only car I've driven with a lot of downforce was was is and the SR three and that actually, if you start sliding or moving at its pace, is fine. Like it's actually pretty chilled. Yeah. Whereas I know some some stuff is less like that, and I think it can be tires and those sorts of things. Like yeah, once the angle gets above a certain amount, you you're done. You want but you it, want a car to be linear. Like yeah. In every aspect, so. You don't want it to suddenly have huge downforce and then drop all that downforce. You want it to bleed off, and that, that's what they've done with the design of this. Yeah, it looks. And, and does the the windscreen? It's got like a little, quite big actually, sort of visor. Does that kick pretty much all the air over your head, or are you still getting whacked in the face? Um, yeah, you, you still feel it. You get a little bit of buffering, but um, it depends. Again, we've got the new car has um, a different pedal box because at the moment it's rear mounted master cylinders um, or reservoirs at the back, and so it's quite tight. So I'm just under six foot on five eleven, and it's about perfect for me. I'd like this, the the pedals a little bit further back, but they've yeah. changed the pedal box to have that in front of you. So we again we'll be able to get to about six six in there. Um, so when the position's set up better, it's going to go over the head. Um, I, I get a little bit of buffeting as it sits, but that screen, simple as it is, is designed to work in conjunction. So it throws the air over your head onto the rear wing. Yeah. So the air will hit the rear wing, give the downforce and bounce off. So yeah, it's all been no, it looks, designed in conjunction. It's not a massive screen, but it is, if you compare it to like a radical, which just has a tiny little bit of plastic yeah. or whatever, yeah. um, which still makes a huge difference. Way less likely to be getting the your chin like yeah. ripped up as you drive along. So we're sat next to our little Mallet Clubman Sport prototype car, which we've uh, we've got for sale at the moment. But if you look at it now, you'll see just in front of the little dash, there's no no oh, yeah. no little. Uh, per I went out first time driving that without that, and I couldn't believe how much my neck was getting abused. Mm. Like I was fighting it all the way, and we put that little bit of screen on, and it just takes all of that away. It's amazing, amazing the difference it makes. So yeah, no, the, the screen on the, the the Spartan really helps. Yeah, and then it, did you? Go to the next level of having the. Do you have little scoops on your helmet? I, 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 yeah, little my helmet and does stuff. have little things that, that yeah, gets yeah, air yeah. in there. Yeah, putting those chin spoilers on. Oh no, I see what you mean. Sorry, for, like the little downforce, the little wings yeah, on. Yeah, the little uh, no, wing on the back and having chin. To that. Yeah, I know. Actually, if you were in any sort of single seater side stuff, that does it does actually make a huge difference because yeah. getting getting your head ripped up as you go down the straight is. is horrifically uncomfortable especially first time when you're not expecting it yeah, well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah first time last time it's, yeah. it's not fun um so you seem to have a thing with australian cars um, yeah. and importing them and i guess taking the downforce to another level you've also come across this car called a hyper racer yes it's a slightly hilarious name yeah. um talk to me about this and and how did you get involved with that so again it, it's um we were looking at avenues of, as I said before, growing the business and different different routes to market and different. We wanted different price points, so we wanted to have something catering for a lot more budget levels rather than top yeah. end. Because the GT40s, I don't think we touched on it. Like if you're ordering one now, you're probably two fifty in. So it's you know yeah. it's a, a lot of money. The Hyper Racer was again. I saw it on Instagram and I was like, that looks really cool. So if if no one's looked at it or seen it, it's a single seater motorcycle engine. It, I guess the best way to describe it would be a single seater radical. Yeah. Um, you know, really extreme aero, huge venturi, big old rear wing, good old front wing. And I saw it. And again, I saw an opportunity in the UK 
because these single make series have, have, have done really, really well. And that's where we want to get to with this. So saw them on Instagram, sent them a message again, exactly like I did with the Spartan. It's like, are you looking for a UK agent? And they're like, yes. So we've, um, we've worked in conjunction with them, which has been brilliant. And um, they have the biggest single seater series in Australia within two years of operation, oh, really? two or three okay, years yeah. of operation. Yeah, they overtook the Formula 5000. Um, I think it was that they were doing over there, the Coyote engine cars. They've just won the rights to the Australian Drivers' Championship, which dates back to Sterling Moss's days, you know, a really prestigious mm -hmm. historic championship. They've got former F3 champions racing there. They've got Ferrari Academy drivers racing with them. So I view it as a way into racing for people who wanted to race when they were younger but didn't have the budget or didn't know how to get into it yeah. they might have gone on and done quite well in business or earned some money or you know come into a bit of money and they want to go racing they want to feel like nigel mansell or whoever their hero yeah. of the day was and you know take cops flat and you know really enjoy yeah. the, the downforce through to someone who wants to develop a racing career but doesn't have the 500,000 million pound budget, whatever it is for Formula 4, yeah. or doesn't have the budget to go to Formula 3, but is around that sort of pace in a championship that can be really competitive. As I say, in Australia, they've got they've got some good names racing these cars. Um, so I think it's going to be a very cost-effective, viable alternative to established big-name Formula. It's a pretty mad looking vehicle like you see like an f3 car and those sorts of stuff and we're all very familiar with that kind of formula shape mm -hmm. but you see an f3 car on track and it kind of looks like slightly simple not like they're simple but you know you're used to that shape and then you see this thing and you're like, what, what the hell is that? that looks absolutely mad these massive like venturi tunnels at the moment a huge wing yeah Single seater. What's the engine in it? It's high booster engine, so stock. The the whole point of the car has been designed with ease of use, ease of maintenance, and cost effective racing. So um, it runs a stock high booster engine. Um, the only thing they do is they flash the ECU to get rid of like traction control and yeah. you know emission controls and all of that sort of stuff, which aren't required for the track. So yeah, fundamentally, you could go to a breakers yard, buy a high booster, put the engine in, and away you go. So yeah, it's about about five fifth. The 500 brake per ton, I think they're about 390. Yeah, so pretty quick. Yeah. Presumably quite a lot of downforce. Yeah, a lot of downforce. Do you yeah. know what sort of G? That's a good question. I probably should know that. Three? I don't think it's quite up at three. Um, I would have thought nearer the two mark, give or take. But um, yeah, it's enough to... It, as I, I was saying to you earlier, I hadn't driven downforce cars mm. before in my first season last year racing it. I understood it and I could feel it but i didn't have that mental understanding that oh no it can do more yeah. and then this season where i've been out in it it's like yeah okay yeah you really can lean on it and you can put your trust in it um how did you go about that process like in your head like because you someone says it, it can go fast this you like, oh, i don't know it's just trying it i think it was um you know going through paddock i was like just each time i break later and later until it would think it was just a lift I reckon it's flat if you're a good driver. Um, <laughs> I'm nearly flat. I'm not that good. Um, and then um, I don't know the corner names, but, you know, going around the back. I mean, I overtook someone on the outside of Dingledale, which was just such a satisfying feeling. Um, so the downforce is huge. And it's just having the confidence to put your trust in that. And that was the sort of mind switch. Yeah. yeah. It's a mad thing driving. Yeah. I, I imagine it's similar to my radical. Like yeah. Similar. It's might be a bit faster in straight line. I don't know. Similar sort of thing. And that feeling of being locked down, it's, it's the same feeling of just driving a normal car within the limits, but you're just going much faster. Like you've got more grip. Yeah. It's like you just, you just got more grip and you yeah. can drive around the outside of someone who's on the limit and yeah. you're like, oh, that's all right. Yeah. Like it's, I'm it's, just cruising around here. It, well, I, 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 <laughs> I'd love to say I was good enough that it, I was just cruising around. But <laughs> it depends but on the you car. I know exactly if you're going you mean, past yeah. something that's like slow, it inspires and, confidence, and you're within the capability of your yeah. car. Yeah, and you're not on that on mm. that edge yet. Yeah, no, they they look it looks like fun. I think one of the things that single seaters, I initially when I was sort of looking at these sorts of things, put me off slightly, is you can't have someone else in the car with you, which. No, I don't really necessarily want. I want to do some laps, come back, and then have have someone talk to me. But it's quite nice to be able to sit 
with someone, mm-hmm. them drive it, yeah. fly out, and you go, oh, yeah. that's what it can do with a passenger in. Yeah, got you. you can obviously do a bit more without a passenger in. Whereas in a single seat, it's just you. Yeah. I think from a driver coach point of view, it's probably quite nice that single seat because they can yeah. watch your onboard footage. <laughs> they can do some laps and show you and get the data and telemetry and, and show you where you can be going and then send you out and do it and, and coach you that way, which is... If I were coaching, it's how I'd want to be doing it. But <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like I don't want to sit passengering with someone pushing it on a racetrack. Yeah. Like plenty of people do it. Yeah, and then, and it's it's fine or whatever. Yeah, and then it's single seater. The only single seater I've driven on track, which is not in the same category, is is a mono. Yeah. So quick. Yeah. Expensive, cool. But that that sitting in the middle in a small thing is so cool. Yeah. Well. um, some of the people that you've spoken to in the past, I think you said you, you chatted with Adam Christodoulou. And um, yeah, so he drove the GT40 and we were talking about pure racing experiences and driving. Here comes Apologies the rain. For Cheers, the rain. England. Um, yeah, and he was saying that, um, you know, the single seaters are the most pure form of racing because it's you in the car and it's an extreme environment of pushing that car to the limit. The joy of the hyper racer is it's quite a draggy car and it's designed as a one make series so um it's not all about top speed but it's designed that you can make the moves you can dive bomb into corners and make it exciting because a lot of single seater formula and i think adam went on to say you know driving a single seater is really extreme the most pure driving experience but the racing isn't as fun as gt racing because you're not you know competing and you're not yeah. um you know you're you're reliant on the aero and you're stuck so this you watch, they, they started getting it televised on YouTube or, um, okay. you know, you can see the whole race weekends. So you can see how close you can get with these cars and it introduces like this really close racing because all cars are, you know, it's like any spec series, like all cars are the same, the same, but you've got a lot of aero uh, drag where you can utilize and dive bomb and, um, you know, take opportunities to get the speed down the straights to, so it make, makes a, a really good car and an enjoyable car to race. So you don't sacrifice too much aero following someone. Cause that's no, always the problem it, with it, it, you're, higher you're, downforce cars. You're, Cause it's got the big wing. We, we, you know, in the UK, we need to get a smaller wing, which is in development at the moment. So that will reduce the drag slightly. Um, but as John and Dean in, in Australia, who built the car said, you know, once you've done 140 or 160 or 180 once, you've done it. That's irrelevant. It's yeah. like how late can you break? How hard can you corner? And that's where the real joy comes in. So when every car is the same, it doesn't matter if you're doing 120 or 160. No, no. Everyone's doing the same. So it's finding that opportunity to to get the overtakes. And that's what this series has done really well, is allowing people to, you know, compete really closely with um, lap times that are exceeding com- um, yeah. comparable. When I was started getting into into racing and and having to go and I don't want to go over stories I've told before in the podcast or whatever, but the idea of something that looks pretty badass and you know it's probably quite quick versus a GT car for mm-hmm. me at the time was really interesting. Yeah, you're like, well, I want to drive that on track because that is nothing like my road car. Yeah, that's going to destroy a road car even like a fast road car whatever to be honest any race car pretty yeah. much destroys any road car yeah on track apparently apart from this little spartan thing <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> presumably if you put that on slicks it would be uh, yeah. very fast yeah yeah i mean rich meaden thought it would have won the fastest lap time if it was on slicks he said there's at least four seconds in it yeah yeah, yeah i mean it makes a big it makes a big old difference yeah getting on slicks yeah no the, the hyper race the thing like it's, it's it looks pretty cool it's cool it's mono shot front and rear You've only got two pedals, so you've got brake and throttle. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a centrifugal, centrifugal clutch, yeah. So, again, you feel like a Formula One driver. You feel... It's, was, that, it's great. was that for ease of use? I believe it was. I think they... So they, they've built several cars through their career to get to the point where they are now and go-karts and all sorts of stuff. And, yeah, it was just a, a really neat solution. Um, the pedal box is quite tight. Small, so you've got okay. space to, to do that. The only, only, only downside to it is... When you're sat on the start line, you don't have that mm, high rev, drop the clutch off, you go. Oh, yeah. What do but, they do? So you, you sit there, you wait. And then when the green light go, you chuck your foot on the throttle and away you go. The joy is nine times out of 10, you'll get a better start. Yeah. Because you're not having to balance the clutch out. You're just going and it's Can you break? Can you like lean it on the brakes? Or? You'll be riding the clutch if you do so. Okay, um, so you're just shredding you don't, stuff. You just don't need to. You dump your foot onto the throttle, see where it's going with the traction, then you just modulate the throttle 
and you, you, yeah, you're, over, you're overtaking. Of... As I say, nine times out of ten, I think you're, you're getting a better start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to have a go in something that has a, a paddle yeah. throttle. Yeah. I mean, normally that's going to be an F1 car, so yeah. yeah. Obviously, I'd I love to have a go in an F1 car. I'd love car. to have a go in an F1 car. <laughs> Any Anyone listeners? listeners? <laughs> two, two willing volunteers here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But no, we can do paddle shift if you want it. Again, the whole ethos of the car is affordability and simplicity. You know, there's no point complicating something. Yeah, and if someone wants to order one of those, what's a hyper racer cost? Um, landed at the moment, you're under 80 grand, um, inclusive of that. That seems pretty good. Yeah, I think. Is it, is it a carbon good. tub? Uh, no, so it's a space frame chassis, but most of, if not all of the body works, carbon fiber. Yeah. You can't just run a single seater on a normal track day or anything, can you? No, it would be test day. So you'd, you'd have single a license. Test day, yeah. Um, yeah. Although I think there's a great business case out there for someone who does track days to do one. I think there's a company that does it, but you've got a 103 decibel limit. So mm. I think there's an opportunity for someone to do a single seat track day. They are just a bit more niche. Yeah, it's they? a bit more niche, a bit more extreme. But I think there's a joy to being over, only able to use it on a test day in the fact that everyone's got their race license. Mm. They all, in theory, know what they're doing. They understand that cars can come quicker yeah. underneath you into a corner and dive bomb or, you know, whatever. They're, they're, they, they tend to be more aware, whereas track days anyone's welcome and that there's a beauty to that like everyone should drive 100%. on track if they have a chance to like just take the opportunity if you've never driven on track go and get on track because it's so much fun but they might be thinking more like okay where what gear do i want to be and where am i braking like focusing on the actual driving rather than what's going on around them and when you're in a single seater they are quick they are aggressive having other people that are aware is quite and, a nice thing yeah and having everyone aware that there's like i'm not going to say no rules because there's not no rules but on a test day, it's like if you're coming past and you want to go past, like there's no specific rule about you've got to pass with permission or on yeah. the left or on the right. It's just you've got to maneuver yeah. and obviously not hit anyone. Yeah. I had a track day recently, which I hadn't been on track in a while. And there were some people driving. There were some race cars on there as well. I was in my uh, GTS, my road car. And in the driver briefing, they were very much like, it's only overtaking on the left yeah. with permission, blah, 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 blah. So like, if you're going to let someone pass, like maybe move out the way or whatever. And this trio of, it was like a cup car, a new RS and like some other stuff, decided that they wanted to come past in Maggots Beckett's. And it's like, okay, guys, but like, come on yeah fine but mm. and then on the way out i knew one of them was still behind and so i was like okay well i'm just gonna i'll just cruise over to the right of the track and you can come past on the left and i'm just cruising over to the right and he tries to go around on the right and you're like why why yeah. And it was it was close. I had to then move left. Mm. And I imagine the guy was like, what are you doing? Why are you getting, like, why yeah. are you going right? It's like, well, this is the rules of yeah. the day we're on. Yeah. In a normal scenario, I'd have been like, whatever, yeah. go past. But yeah, because of that, I was in such a rage. I was yeah. so annoyed. Yeah, well, the, you know, you, you've got a lot of money on the line, firstly, and cars that you're passionate yeah. about. But more than that is your personal safety. And, you know, for wanting to stay with your mates and have a few laps together, it's not worth, the rules are there for a reason and you know this is this is why i think test days are great because i love you know, a test day yeah everyone is at a level as i say everyone has a right to be on track everyone should get on track track days are brilliant but observe the rules they're there for a reason exactly like that because you were trying to observe the rules but someone not following the rules put everyone in danger and you were yeah. doing the right thing getting out of the way because the other thing as well is where the ego gets involved and someone's like well i'm in a better car or a faster car i've got a I'm fast not letting car you go straight. through yeah and it's just like just let them go and have some fun so yeah that's an interesting one um on track days when you've got cars if i was to do a lot of track days which i, I don't anymore but i i think i would lean towards something I, I love having the radical but i think for driving a car like that on track days you probably want more horsepower on the straights. Yeah. Not because you need it for a fast lap, any of that rubbish. It's like if for some reason you get stuck behind someone in a 911 turbo or something that's got a lot, like yeah. 720s. Dodge Charger. <laughs> <laughs> something with huge horsepower. Which they've, you've, you've sat behind them. So you're not allowed, you can't really use momentum yep. 
from the corners and then they get to the straight and they plant it, yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. No. And you're like, well, the only way I'm going to get past you is yeah. on the brakes. Yeah. And, and you're, you're not allowed. You're not, and you're not allowed or you're not going to like yeah. it. Yeah. I think I, I'm at an age now where if I'm on that day, it's know your audience. And so I will drop back yeah. and then see how quick I can catch up and just play it that way. And equally, I'm being a bit harsh on first sometimes they're just focusing on their own thing and if you're in a radical oh, yeah. and they're in a big car they might not have just seen you and that's why being on a test day is great because people are aware and conscious so yeah i totally see what you're saying it, it's um that, it can be really frustrating. that can be quite a good like game as well because you're not you're not setting laptops like mm -hmm. it, you're not you're not winning any prizes or anything yeah but you can go okay i know i'm going to come on this car in a certain amount of time can i time it so that it's on the exit yeah. i hit them at the exit yeah. at the start of the straights rather than yeah. the entry yeah. to a set of corners yeah, yeah. And that can be quite fun yeah. it's fun and I, I guess it comes back to 60s racing whereby you'd have a lola t70 mm. and a chevron b19 or b16 or whatever it is and it's exactly that it was david and goliath it's like hammer it down the straights but quicker in the braking zones for the smaller cars and so you can sort of get a sense of that which is quite fun yeah, yeah. And you see it with some series. Uh, I think there's a GT2 series. I don't know whether it's still running, which was like slightly modified. I think Audi made one. Porsche did a 935 type thing. And they did a GT2 RS, mm -hmm. like track specific car. And I think the idea with that series was going to be more horsepower, less aero, less okay. grip. Or like, yeah, less aero. So that actually, for them, it was like, you're more likely to be able to overtake yeah. on the straights. You're yeah. not having to overtake in the braking in the corning. Yeah. And actually there's a lot of less incidents. Yeah. If that's the case. Yeah. But I think, isn't that what Ferrari challenge do? Um, they seem to have with, a lot of incidents. Anyway. They do have a lot of incidents, <laughs> but I mean, I think it, compared to the GT3 cars, it's lower, yes. lower aero, more power. Yeah. But what b billionaire banger racing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the, the videos of, it's not just that series. It happens in GT3 and other stuff like that. But like corner one, and like some of these series is yeah. just like yeah. eight million pounds worth of damage done. Yeah. Like it's, absolutely it's, insane. It is. It is. Um, it is. I, I think with racing, you say you've done racing as well. Yeah, I've done yeah. some radical yeah, racing it, and stuff. Yeah, that's always the biggest concern. I think. I think turn one, lap one in anyone's book is always the, uh, the most losing. nervous, yeah, the most nervous time in a race because everyone, it's that mentality of you need to win the race on the first lap where you don't, but you can gain really good advantage if you get a good start. That's the, that's the, the balancing point because everyone always says, oh yeah, yeah, like no one wins it on the first lap and you're like, yeah, but <laughs> often it definitely in an amateur series and I was uh, like, I'm definitely an amateur and my first laps are nowhere near as fast as maybe laps four onwards because mm -hmm. I kind of like warming up and like as yeah. I've got more experience maybe they get a bit quicker sure. but because of that yeah. if you haven't for whatever reason haven't qualified that great you can make up so much yeah. in the first two laps yeah. or first corner because yeah. everyone's a bit like ah yeah <laughs> but then again <laughs> you can also lose it yeah, you can lose a lot at that same time yeah yeah it's um test days are great Track days are great, but there's something about racing that just gives it that next level, isn't it? It's just that thrill of you versus yeah. the machine, but you versus the competitor. And, and yeah, just, and for me, there's definitely a lot of fear. There's so many, <laughs> I, I need to do some more. Yeah. Um, but like this before the start of a race, just I'm just like bricking it. Yeah. Oh, and then and then like after you know once you're in it and you're on it, and then I start enjoying it, but. There's a point in time where I'm like, I don't even know where I'm here. <laughs> but I, th I think that's healthy. I don't know how professional racing drivers feel. I'd assume they still get that adrenaline and that nerve before the start of the race. I think when you don't have that, you're complacent. And I think that's where danger happens. Yeah. Um, I think you've got to have that help because I think all your senses are heightened, right? So you are looking in the mirror to see if someone's dive bombing or spinning behind you and going to take you out and have that awareness. Or stalled it's, on the start line yeah, or whatever. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, that's, that's, that's hideous when that happens. Yeah. There's something about the race. If you could race in any race series, what would you choose? So in your sort of, I'm going to say stage of life. My stage of life. Um, so probably not F1. What are you saying? Unless you're Alonso. <laughs> so. To be fair, you've got plenty of time. Yeah, I've got, yeah, I got a good few years. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, I think I'm an okay club racer. Um, I, I'd argue that my skill set <laughs> runs to Formula One levels of talent. But um, a Lola T70 has been the car that my father had 
throughout my childhood. Sadly, he got cancer in 2007, uh, came through it, but had to sell the car on the operation. Uh, so I missed the opportunity. I was just getting to a point. I'd done enough racing that I was at a point where I could race it, or oh. at least drive it on track. And that, that fell through. So um, something like Le Mans Classic, Silverstone Classic in or Spa in a T73B would be well up there. I think the other one that I always used to say Le Mans 24 hours, and I'd love to do that. I think that'd be an amazing experience. Nürburgring 24 hours. Mm. I think that is bucket list. Like just again, very fortunate through what I do to know a few people that are racing there. Um, Jimmy Broadbent recently, yeah. um, he, he, he took the GT40 on a thousand mile road trip and um, top guy. And he, you know, seeing all of that, it's like, yeah, that would be fun. That would be fun. That would, I think Le Mans has like an appeal to me, mm -hmm. but not, not an insane appeal. Like if I was to pick one 24 hour race, okay. Yeah. Maybe you'd be like, I've done Le Mans in yeah. a cool car or whatever. That's cool. But the track doesn't actually appeal that much to me. I think maybe in reality it's really awesome, but it's all like high speed, yeah, high speed, I, big balls, corners. Yeah. I mean, my slow stuff. My company's called Le Mans Coupes, right? So I'm biased towards Le Mans. I no, love, I, I love, I love Le Mans. It's, it's like I will try and watch for 24 hours if I can. I'll try and get there whenever I can. Love the event. Love the history of it. I love the car. I think now this modern range of um, hypercars has made it really, really interesting. And the GT3 cars opening up to different. Mm. It's a fantastic thing. I think the problem with it is with my skill set and budget, it's a little bit less attainable. So yeah. if I could choose between Nürburgring 24 hours and Le Mans 24 hours and like, right, you're fully funded, you can go and do it. I'd choose Le Mans 24 hours because then I would have raced the Le Mans 24 hours. Yeah. And that's like, to, in my eyes, the, the pinnacle of endurance. List. It's like, yeah, that, that is bucket list. But what category? I, oh, you'd want to be hypercar. <laughs> yeah, you want to be in the top. <laughs> so I'd want to win Le Mans. <laughs> like, I want the watch, I want the trophy, I want the, the you know, the uh, immortality. It would be amazing. What would you go with? Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you go, there's the one which is like, what might loosely possibly be possible at like the age and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. And I think a GT car is quite appealing. Mm -hmm. I'd love to win. Okay. Ignore the win part, but I'd love to drive yeah. in a Porsche. Yeah. I just love the brand. Yeah. And so in a GT3, you know, I've got an RS and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. That would be quite cool. But I think now that we've gone to GT3 spec cars, I think the racing's probably awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's and fair. the proposition of owning one of those cars is probably better. Yeah, but back when it was GTE, GTE Porsche, but then like, you know, come on, LMP two, LMP one, yeah, that one, LMP one, GT one, whatever, like that top category yeah. prototype. Having done a bit of prototype, like baby prototype racing, I can't imagine what it's like driving one of those cars yeah. at those speeds. I bet it's epic. Yeah, on the limit. I mean, it's like when Porsche did the what was it nine one nine. Um, oh yeah, but they they, they took away all the re yeah the unlimited. I mean, quicker Whoa. than F one. Like, can you imagine that, that? spa lap? Yeah, and then and the Nurburgring. Yeah, yeah, Holy yeah. Holy, yeah, jeez, <laughs> incredible. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I think I would love the opportunity. Do you know what? If someone gave me the opportunity to race in a two CV, I'd take it. Like, just awesome it doesn't fun. matter if if you're on the limit in whatever you're on the limit in. That's or, or getting as close as you can that your skill set allows. I think that yeah is is brilliant. But to experience cutting edge technology in a hypercar or in the gts as you say like you know because the technology in them now is incredible yeah it'd be great to experience it but historics is where my heart is yeah i need to do I've, I've not really driven anything i've not driven anything i'd say historic on track i'd, lo I'd love to do that so yeah. the way they drive and the way people drive them looks pretty fun yeah just looks fun it is i mean um alex brundle um he's very big in the historic game now and um you know speak to him about it and you know how much he loves them because it's it's just a different driving style you get movement within the cars it's you know it's not all reliant on an aero yeah. and um, i think one of the joys of the historic stuff is the variety i mean the spa six hours this weekend as we're recording i don't know when this is coming yeah, out yeah. but um yeah it's, it's the spa six hour and that's brilliant because firstly our cars are at the front uh, <laughs> winning with our gt40s um but also you get mgbs you get aston martin db5s you get ford galaxies ford mustangs you get all of this variety and it's just brilliant like different sounds different sights it's it, yeah it's incredible there's, there's a lot to be said for that yeah, and having the the differential in the cars like same lap time it, it, loosely with some stuff 
but a very different way of doing it. Yeah. That does make really cool racing. It really does. It really, and it goes back to what we're saying about the track days and test days is like, you have people that will have to make the Hail Mary move into a corner because they just don't have the guts down the straight. I mean, again, Goodwood Revival, you see it with the minis versus the yeah. uh, the Ford Galaxies. It's like, it's it's just so much fun to watch because it's like back and forth, back and forth. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for historic racing and the variety that, and the entertainment it provides. Yeah. And we don't get, you, you can't, no race series is really going to make that now. No. You're never going to get that. Except for the Hyper Racer X1. <laughs> no, but no, you're I'm not. Because like, no, it's yeah, the same yeah. car. Yeah. You're yeah. not going to get the variety no, of yeah. manufacturers yeah, and 100%. vehicle design. No. Like even, we get it with GT3 cars, mm-hmm. like, uh, but you don't. Because even well, like the Bentley or whatever, they are different, but they're not that different. But it's the, the balance of performance, right? So, and, and the regulations sort of stipulate that you go down an avenue. This is where Can-Am was such a great series. Um, you know, the, the, the historic, you know, the big old March 707s or whatever they were, or the McLaren MAFs and all of this versus, as I say, the Chevron B21s and, um, you know, whatever Ferrari 500s, whatever stuff. it was. You got all this different variety and it was like um, Shadow have had a big thing, haven't they, recently with Goodwood. Um, and all this just like, it was just engineers do what you want to meet this objective of winning. Yeah. And there's something very beautiful about that. I'd love that in GT racing. I don't know not doing it so i can't like, comment from someone that's raced in it but like externally i don't really like balance of performance mm-hmm. and i think in f1 i was listening to some i think it was adrian you talking recently and he was saying with the way the rules are starting to get so specific on mm-hmm. bodywork and mm-hmm. stuff we're almost kind of straying into balance of performance territory where people do come up with different designs yeah but they sort of end up in the same place. Whereas like, there's part of me that goes, okay, just give it a budget and some loose rules. Yeah. And you're not allowed to make more than this power. Yeah. You're not allowed to whatever. Yeah. And just see where people go. Mm. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I'd agree. And that, again, I'd said it a moment ago, that Can-Am was great for that because it was just like, you've got a brief rule book, go nuts, like find the best solution to win this race. Yeah. I think it becomes quite challenging in the modern age where there's such big, budgets involved but not just like budgets to run the cars but like sponsorship money everything around it it becomes a business rather than it's still a sport obviously and like all of these things are coming from quite an extreme point of view where i'm a a most sport fan through and through so i'm not belittling anything yeah yeah. but you can understand why it's where it's at i think reduction in weight and size in for i think i probably the same interview that adrian was that you listened to like he was saying yeah just like like have a small element of um, electric. Maybe a tiny bit of hybrid. But yeah, to hybrid, be honest, yeah, the cars, too, like as a fan, it would be great to see smaller cars, mm-hmm. naturally aspirated, awesome sounding engines. Yeah. Like no one gives, it doesn't yeah. bloody matter what yeah. the fuel economy is on an yeah. F1 car. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not the purpose of the racing. But again, I can understand why they're pushing the message and, you know, see, but yeah, for Where me, it's, it's the extreme, it's, it's the pinnacle of motorsport. It should be the pinnacle of motorsport. You should be racing and achieving the best lap times that you can. I think in today's day and age, there has to be a environmental I think, I think I know, fine environment, and do what I you can, but the racing shouldn't be infect, uh, impacted. See what I mean? Like I can understand. Yeah, use your green trucks to get there. Use a green. Yeah, fuel. try and do all of Fine. that. Do everything you can, but the racing should be the pure racing about the best car, the best driver, the best, the best experience yeah. for the people watching. Yeah, well, like like Adrian said, I think it's when the V10 comes mm. out, everyone just stops what they're doing, goes trackside, and listens and watches. It's yeah, there's a lot to be said. Yeah, one day, somewhere, somehow, it will happen. I'm going to sure get in one of those cars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're experienced on that. Paul Rickard, they do the old. They do Renault. something, yeah. It's, it's, I think it's punchy, but yeah, well, it's, it's gonna be, isn't yeah. it? A few of my mates in a, in a sort of racing WhatsApp group that comes up occasionally, and yeah. we're like, we're gonna do it. But one, obviously, the price that's put it up. But yeah. we're also like, I don't want to do two laps. Yeah. I yeah. want to do 20 laps. Yeah. Well, do, right, do five the and then see if you want to do the next 15. <laughs> Let's see how your neck's holding up, I think. But um, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. It would be a fantastic opportunity. So are you racing the Hyper Racer? Yeah. Um, we race with Monoposto at the moment. It's been a, um, I haven't been out as much as I wanted to do this season just because the workshop and business has been, you know, we've been quite busy, um, haven't had the opportunity and um, yeah, I'm waiting on this development of the rear wing. So yeah. I want How's to have- your neck? 
Hey, uh, fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not not bad. No, no it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's um, it's fine. I mean, the G forces are there, but they're not they're not F one level by any any stretch. So, yeah. And also, the races are 15, 20 minutes long, so okay. it, it's short enough that you're not properly properly yeah. suffering. Um, yeah. Have you had one of those like a test day where you've got to the end and you're like, I need a I need a head support. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's part of the reason. So when you're in the cockpit, you've got a um, head support. Oh, okay. So yeah, you're, yeah. Um, it's sort of surrounding the, so you don't. That makes you, a you huge can, difference. You can just lean your head on it. So uh, maybe that's why, because I don't do any neck training. I think it's because it's all there for me to, to do it. The worst was when I didn't have a, a screen on the mallet. Oh um, yeah. That, like, that yeah is... it, it genuinely, it was like I was fighting it the whole way. I was like, oh. And then the next day, yeah, yeah you're done. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's savage. Right. I normally wrap this up with five questions. Yeah. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? Most memorable driving trip or journey? Um, going to the Le Mans Classic with Dad in a... Oh, there's two actually. Another one's just popped to mind. Uh, in our former demo, Daytona Cobra. It was just great road tripping in mm. a classic car with my dad to Le Mans. Like it was just nice. it was just iconic. And then we came back from Goodwood. I was in a GT40. He was in the uh, Mark II Cobra up here and we were always within the speed limit, but we um, had great fun getting there and playing. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was a brilliant trip. And we were also joined by a Dodge Viper, you know, the one with the wing is GTS or GTS, whatever yeah. it was. So yeah, we had, we had great fun on that road trip. It was just, it was just, you do an overtake and then I'd stay in the outside lane because I wanted to let dad know it was okay yeah. to overtake two and then yeah, pull yeah. it. And it, it was, it was just such fun. That driving with like people, you know, well, people who I'd say drive as a group. Well, yeah. Doing that sort of thing where you, like, if people have not come across this, sometimes if I'm driving in a group of cars and you're overtaking yeah you basically stay out mm -hmm. with the indicator on yeah and yeah. everyone behind you knows that yeah. as far as you can see mm -hmm. there is no one coming yeah. and as long as there's no turn offs and yeah. whatever yeah and it allows you to do overtakes that are you wouldn't otherwise be able to do yeah you don't you can't see yeah and it, you get a real feeling of making progress yeah yeah it, it, it's, it's really nice i think with all of these things when you're playing with fast cars and i'm not telling people listening how to suck eggs you know that everyone's responsible and um and safe but i think i'm very fortunate in the fact that they're my company cars not my cars so i respect them probably a bit more than i would if it was my own car <laughs> um because i think on some of these tours you hear of people letting excitement get the better Easy of judgment to do. and Easy yeah to very do. very and you know we've all been there like i'm not not sitting here as a saint we've all we've all been there but i think it's just throw caution to it and do you know <laughs> be a bit conscious about who who's egging you on and why and uh yeah, yeah and then i think most people that have driven on the road have had some moments where you've mm. gone hmm i would have made that decision differently second yeah. time around yeah and if you get to make the second decision the second time around then fine then yeah. like good yeah that's good yeah, yeah. And, and next time around you know we all we do things a bit differently or whatever. yeah but yeah it's, it's like it's good fun driving with like a couple of mates yeah small group yeah kind of empty roads and have a bit of fun isn't yeah it? if you can only drive one sports car and you've got like a cheap car on the side for family duties or whatever uh, for the rest of your life what would it be for me the goat is a lola t73b like that's it and like that there are a couple that are on the road so okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would count um and if i've got a cheap run around i just run around in that and just take the t70 to a, nice. to a track nice. yeah that Fair enough. Um, what do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? That's a really good question. Um, I'm sort of quite insular to my world. I'd say the Malika I got here is uh, ridiculously. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> excluding things you're trying yeah, to sell. Yeah. Um, oh, I really don't know. Undervalued. I think with the way the market is it's at tricky. the moment, quite a lot of stuff that was overvalued is now resetting to uh, to that. Genuinely drawing a blank I'll, I'll, I'll give it a thought and i'll come back no worries no worries uh most interesting car what are you googling looking up researching pondering i like looking at the extreme things like the um aston mark and valkyrie mm. um the, the pro versions of those um adrian newey's new release the uh, what's that one called rb is it 17 yeah could could well yeah. be like those sorts of things like looking at them and looking at just how extreme they are I think that's absolutely fascinating. That car. Like you look at the other, you look at the Astons and like for what they've done and for putting it on the road. Yeah. This is unbelievable. Yeah. Just like 
a Valkyrie on the road. It's yeah. just a completely bonkers thing. So this RB17, it's a track only car. So it's just a different kettle of fish. But equally, like, that's the track car. Yeah. That's the one yeah, you yeah. want. Yeah. Stuff all the Ferrari 963, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Nah, 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 yeah. nah, nah. If you want stats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that's Red a stats car, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I just, just thought of a little car. It's, it's funny enough, it stems back to my brother. He's got a little um, Fiat Panda 100 horsepower. Oh, I hear they're pretty good. So I used to have a Twingo RS um, yeah. 133 Cup, which was tuned to 165 through KTEC Racing. Those sorts of things, I would say, are the most undervalued cars because I think you can pick up a Panda 100, 100 horsepower for two, three thousand pounds. You can have the most fun in there. Yeah. Like it revs to like whatever, seven, eight, whatever it does. You're top of third, you're doing about 22 miles an hour, but you feel like an absolute hero. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, that I think the amount of fun you can have in them and not be licensed losing speeds. You know, still be sensible. Yeah, I think those sort of small hot hatches. Same with the the Twingo I had. It was just the only, I, I sold it because um, I, I went to Worthing a lot and just sitting on the motorway with the with with the exhaust noise, I was a bit over it. Yeah. Um, but back lanes, it was hard to beat. Yeah, I think those, I think those cars. I'd love to do an afternoon of like meet up with like five people. Yeah, with those sorts of cars. Yeah, like cheap, fun, light drive flat out yeah just have an afternoon driving like, i think you'd it's a very different experience to meeting up with a bunch of people in supercars or yeah. whatever but like you'd have a lot of fun yeah 100 percent. a lot of fun 100 percent. 100 percent. i yeah I, I think they're they're the smiles per gallon or whatever they call it i don't know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like the fun you can have in some like uh, um yeah in a, a a low budget sporty little car like that it's, it's brilliant yeah and it's it's definitely not lesser than more expensive stuff like it's not i think this is why companies like caffeine machine or the local one is talk moto cafe yeah um have you ever been no uh, it's, it's How just close near, is it? near horsham okay um don't know maybe we'll go and grab a bite to eat there if you want afterwards i don't know i don't know what your time saying but um the joy of them is they celebrate cars and pet yeah. and everything that encompasses and it goes back to what i said about the gt40 enthusiast club like not everyone has a budget to buy a no. ferrari or an aston or you know, T70 or GT40, whatever it is, but they love cars and there's a place for it. And I, that's what I really love about the car community is mm. it's very welcoming. And places yeah. like that, those sort of like hubby type places, caffeine machines is, is a perfect example. The community that appears and like, I'm not really involved in any community events. Yeah. I'm only a small kid and just like, I don't have any time. Yeah. But I did a podcast with Phil and stayed there overnight. Bad idea. Not because it's not a nice place to stay. I just so happened to be on one of the nights. Yeah. So there was like music and stuff playing yeah. till like yeah. 11. Yeah. Um, but the community that came out, I think it was their Japanese night. Yeah. It's just awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. And everyone with their modified MX-5s and all sorts of, all sorts of really cool yeah. stuff. And you're just like, this, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, and I'm, I'm not, I don't see this on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis, yeah. but like, that is cool. Yeah, you get like K cars coming out and then you yeah. get the GTRs and like everything in between, like your, um, uh, what are those little boxy ones? Um, yeah, all, all sorts of stuff. And yeah, I love car culture. And I think that's... Uh, and yeah. yeah, and what people do, it's not because with less money, but like often if you've got a huge budget, you kind of, people end up seem to do the, the standard stuff. You end up with like a singer or something, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Great. But the inventive and cool ways people make their cars unique with not much money yeah. is also like super cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it allows creative freedom to make a car what you want it to be, which is, there's a lot to be said for it. Yeah. And a bit less stuffiness in yeah. some brands. Yeah. Um, five car garage, unlimited value. Got to loosely fit into your life. Loosely fit. So if you yeah. have a, I don't know, some car to drive to work or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Are oh, we taking my cars as a given? Put them to a corner because I genuinely. You choose five of. No, I wouldn't choose five of them. <laughs> um, I'd have. A you can have one. one. You can have one. If 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 that would fit into your five. Yeah, I, I think I think the Spartan. Yeah. Yeah. That's love interesting. it. Interesting. That's not taking anything away from the others at all because I love them. It's just yeah. the rules that I'm only allowed one. I think we've got a VW Amarok as a work truck and yeah. such an incredible you know, great thing. I'd get the latest spec, one of them. I'd get a motorhome. 
I'm looking at oh, nice. Winnebago's at the moment, like a, you know, 30. Like a big one. Yeah, 30, 40 foot, no, 30, 40 foot, 30, 32 foot um, diesel pusher. To travel around. To go to in, racetracks. Or go to racetracks. When I'm at a race weekend, I can oh, yeah. chill in my motorhome. Uh, yeah, that'd be amazing. Love that. Slide out, leveling. Yeah, oh, the, yeah, the whole, yeah. whole shebang, like do it properly. Uh, two more. I would go something collectible. Let's go for a Ferrari 250 GTA just because if everything else goes to <laughs> the, the pan, you can sell it and you're, you're um, and then what have we got? We've got some sensible cars in there and I, I I'm not going to say T70 because I've said it a million yeah. times through this thing and it's a given. Um, fifth car, I don't know, something quirky, just a toy. I think I'd have something fun. Um, I've always liked old Corvettes. Okay. They're quite fun. Like a, an old C5 or C6 yeah. Corvette, not huge value. You can have a lot of fun with it. You can tune it. Oh uh, no, I'll tell you what, I'll go uh, 550 Maranello. Oh. Uh, yeah, Ferrari yeah, yeah. 550 Maranello. Yeah. That, Color? Yeah. Oh, British Racing Green, maybe. Um, mm. That'd be nice. Yeah, I've always, I've always liked them. I've, I've always liked them. I've never driven one. No, nor have I. Yeah. I suspect that might be... I know, I need, to, I need to have a go in one at some point, somewhere. They're yeah. cool. I'd really look at those and go, yeah, 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 nice. I, th- I think they've aged beautifully. I think, gosh, however many years ago, they were quite low value. You could pick them up relatively cheap mm. and they, 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 they've appreciated it, which is always nice. But yeah, what a car. Like, what a, like yeah, a, as, cool a, as a GT car, I think, it, I, I think it stood the test of time. And it's like, it's quite cyclical with cars. And I think this has come back to that point where it's just classy yeah. And beautiful and yeah. Yeah, it's not the you've got an eight twelve or the twelve cylinder or whatever, which is like the big kind of like, fuck you type, <laughs> type situation. You know, and I say this as, as someone who had an eight twelve at one point, but like the modern V twelve yeah. is that image. Yeah. Whereas this is like it's out of that now. Yeah. Now it's just a cool old Ferrari. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, thanks very much for yeah. coming to the podcast and yeah. show me around and let me drive a GT forty. Yeah, it was no. pretty cool. No problems. Well, um, we'll get you out in some other cars at some point in the future. Sweet. Thanks very much. Appreciate your time.